Are they going to hear me? No, right. Pardon me? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Just a shot 545, right? Hey, everybody. It's um, Mark Warner, and welcome to my Facebook Live. I just came from voting against a um, totally unqualified judicial candidate. Um, part of the effort on um, to try to make sure that we we um, don't totally load up, not not um, this particular vote, but I worry that you know it, it appears with um, COVID nineteen raging, one hundred twenty thousand people, forty two four hundred twenty thousand Americans dead, forty two million Americans that have. Um, have um, filed for unemployment and millions of Americans rightfully protesting against peaceful or against police injustice. You would think we might be dealing with one of those issues as opposed to um, as opposed to Mitch McConnell's effort to um, stack the judiciary. But unfortunately, uh, three days after Juneteenth, that is not the not the case, although there is a chance that the, the Senate will be moving to um, beginning debate or starting debate about the uh, policing reforms. We've got a very strong bill uh, that Senator Cory Booker and Senator Kamala Harris put together, the Justice and Policing Act, which makes real meaningful systemic reform on preventing chokeholds, preventing uh, no knock warrants from making sure that there's uh, <clears throat> appropriate transparency on law enforcement officers actions so you can't bump from one department to another uh, trying to make sure that we do the kind of data and demographic uh, studies that that need to take place in in policing to actually put in place something that we should have done 20 years ago 30 years ago 50 years ago um, anti-lynching legislation at the federal level and the unfortunate thing is that it again appears that um, Senator McConnell is trying to halt um, any kind of meaningful debate. So stay tuned on that and, and more will be coming up in the next um, day or two. I want to make sure we get to as many of these questions as possible. And for those of you who are Virginians, um, tomorrow I get to discover who my Republican opponent is going to be. I'm anxious to see what kind of turnout. In, in the Republican primary, suffice it to say, based upon absentee ballot requests, those districts that had a Democratic um, primary no, uh, nomination have seen substantial numbers of requests. Those that have simply had a Republican congressional um, primary or no congressional primary, simply the Senate primary, have seen um, remarkably low. I think the, I'm not sure, but I believe the lowest statewide primary in recent years had like 450, 460,000 votes. So we'll see if uh, um, the Republican statewide primary uh, exceeds that tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as of tomorrow afternoon, the general election campaign starts. And I can assure you I'm not taking anything for granted. I'm going to welcome whoever is uh, the Republican opponent into the race. And um, I intend to, to run you know, leave no part of Virginia behind from Southwest to South side to the Valley to obviously the 9564 corridor to the Eastern shore, you name it. Uh, and really want to present vision of why I hope Virginians will rehire me. Now, on that note, let me um, go ahead and, and start taking some of these um, questions. A couple of folks have gone ahead and emailed in some questions ahead of time, but let's get to these and we'll probably do this until, uh, about 6.30 and uh, anxious to try to get to as many of these from um, as possible. Maurice from Manassas has asked, what's being done to mitigate attacks on our right to vote um, and right to vote to also include vote by mail? Well, you know, we in Virginia, elections really do matter. Um, the Virginia General Assembly this year made election day a holiday. They added 20 days of early voting. They added absentee, you know, no excuse absentee, so you can mail in your vote or vote absentee uh, well, just because you want to. And obviously with the threat of COVID, 
Um, this is a, a um, uh, I think, a extraordinarily important um, criteria to have. We have put hundreds of millions of dollars of additional election security assistance in um, the COVID legislation. I think we need to do more. But what we hear, un unfortunately, from this president is this, you know, kind of slightly wacky obsession against voting by mail, making up things um, about uh, about how voting by mail skews to one party or another, no factual data on that, or somehow skews to abuse, no factual data on that. And I fear that the president's, even his threats to not fund the post office may um, be involved in, in his efforts to um, uh, you know, prohibit this tool, a tool which I'd point out, he uses himself, the height of hypocrisy, in terms of voting in his new home state in Florida, um, but um, also is used very effectively in states that have strong, strong Republican control like Utah. I think we need to do, we need to get additional resources, um, Maurice, to uh, our state voting boards, Democrat and Republican states alike, obviously. I think we need to constantly be on guard about foreign interference and thank goodness our intelligence professionals are continuing to do that. And I think we have to fight uh, vociferously, not only in Virginia, but across the country to make sure that people's rights to vote are protected. One of the reasons why as well, when we talk about the contact tracing, um, I am very concerned about some states, I don't think it'll happen in Virginia, using data that might come from contract tracing because somebody may have at some point gotten sick or somebody is saying, you know, if they try to start prohibiting people from voting based upon whether they have a temperature or something, um, there's a lot of speculation out there. We need to do all we can to prevent that. So this is an issue uh, that I've worked on for the last three and a half years as um, vice chairman of the intelligence committee, and you've got my commitment, I'm gonna stay working on it. Carol <clears throat> um, from Lynchburg, um, Virginia says she moved to Lynchburg about five years ago, and, and um, she's very impressed by the farmer's market in Lynchburg and the small independent restaurants. I can tell you, Carol, um, downtown Lynchburg and the Lynchburg restaurant scene has gotten a lot, lot better. Um, as well as the number of downtown hotels, uh, coffee shops. And I do think, <clears throat> you know, coming out of COVID, you know, our restaurant businesses are going to have some of the hardest time about coming back. We're starting to see reopening, obviously, in parts of Virginia in phase two, parts of Virginia are moving to phase three. I think, though, from both the congressional standpoint, <clears throat> we're going to do need to do more for independent restaurants over the longer haul. I think we may have to do more around retail. Uh, I also think we're going to have to be experimental. I'm very interested. There's an idea that's been floating around. This is not fully ready for prime time that says, um, could we borrow a concept from World War II where we created war bonds? And we took that idea, or some people took that idea, and after 9-11 created freedom bonds where there may be some backstop, but communities could invest in long-term capital at a low interest rate. And that long-term capital that would be coming from the sale of these bonds could be used to support, frankly, even on a community-wide basis, things like independent restaurants, art venues, music venues. And um, again, the idea is not fully flushed out, um, but I think we're gonna have to use a series of tools, both governmental and ideas like these bonding authorities, public-private ideas to make sure that, you know, we bring our communities back to where they were pre-COVID in terms of arts outside, um, restaurants, but it's going to take a lot of creative thought. Um, uh, Ron from Woodbridge has asked, will you sponsor a bill to modernize and revitalize the Voting Rights Act? Yes, uh, Ron, I would. I think the Voting Rights Act, which has been a bit emasculated by certain Supreme Court decisions, um, and unfortunately, we've, we've seen, and as, as we've seen, not only in policing injustices, um, after the murder of George Floyd and, and other murders across the country. Uh, but in voting, um, there is still too much racial disparity and we need a free and a fair voting system. The old Voting Rights Act was hugely important. Uh, I believe it was section four that got undone. Um, I may be wrong on that, but I think we do need to, you know, think about, and I hope again, in a democratic administration, we can work to strengthen voting rights for, for all Americans, um, regardless of, of you know, where they are and who they, who they look like. Um, 
Jane from Fairfax County has said, asked me, you've called for the resignation of Attorney General William Barr. Where does that stand? Well, Jane, uh, as we saw again this weekend, when this Attorney General, who uh, I also called a henchman for, for Donald Trump, decided to act potentially without even legal authority on trying to fire the New York um, um, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, one of the most important positions in our Justice Department. And it appears with no reason other than the fact that this uh, Mr. Berman, the Southern District U.S. Attorney, seemed to be doing his job by, uh, in this case, investigating some shady characters around Mr. Trump, in particular his, um, his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. And the fact that Mr. Berman refused that potentially inappropriate firing by Mr. Barr. Trump then fired him on Saturday, but my efforts to try to get Barr to resign, uh, I'm not sure there's, there's going to be any meaningful effort there. I think the best way we can get Barr to resign is to um, fire Donald Trump and his whole cabinet as well. Um, let me make sure we start going to some of these questions. Um, okay. Um, let's see. All right, Dina Cruz and is asking a question about the inmates at the um, um, ICE Center, the Customs and Enforcement Center in Farmville, Virginia. I've been following that. I did actually a, a, a Zoom call earlier with a number of the immigrant rights groups. And I, um, Dina has said that 34 people have now tested positive there. Let me get an update on that. It, the numbers were a little better last week. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to get complete release of all those, uh, of all those inmates. Um, but Dina, if you'll make sure, and if I can make sure my staff will follow up with you, let me get some more data on that. Uh, but we have, <clears throat> I've been very interested in making sure that there was full testing of everybody in Farmville, um, the ICE facility there, guards and inmates, and that we take appropriate action to make sure people are, are as safe as possible. And obviously I have been supportive on early release uh, that the state has been fairly effective at and parts of the federal penitentiary system have been fairly effective at. But Dean is right that I don't think we've seen as much action from the ICE facilities, which um, bears further examination. And, and Dean, you deserve a, a fuller answer. Um, Faith from Woodbridge is asking me, what do I feel about making election day a national holiday? And what are you going to fight, do to fight voter suppression, suppression in this country? Um, well, Faith, we've made um, Election Day a holiday in Virginia. That kudos go to our Democratic General Assembly and Governor Northam for that. Uh, whether we make a national holiday on Election Day, you know, I, I think we're having a lot of debates right now on, on that day. We're having a debate as well about whether Juneteenth um, should be a national holiday. I, need to say I gave my staff Juneteenth off. I think it was an appropriate day to honor um, what for on a historic basis for many uh, uh, black Americans is viewed as, as an equivalent of an Independence Day. Um, and I think we, you know, having a series of holidays that reflect our values right now, as well as our history and heritage is important. And, um, um, you know, whether Election Day as it is a holiday and many other countries falls into that is something that I think, you know, um, I will spend some more time on. Although, again, in Virginia, we've already made that um, uh, about, we've already made that decision to go ahead and, and make that a holiday. Um, let's see here. I know this is, I mean, Helena and a number of others have asked me about these questions around defund the police. I, I just, you know, I know for many of you, we may agree to disagree on this, um, but I don't think that slogan or that policy um, is something that I support. I, I do support, you know, rethinking the role of policing. I think we ask our police officers to take on a lot of roles that, they may not be appropriately trained for. I think, you know, if we can make sure that we have more mental health resources, more social services resources um, to get out into the community, uh, I think that is the way that we can better 
meet people's needs with people's skill set. Um, I think it's been very interesting to look at a number of our European countries where they have very little violence with the police. Uh, but in many of those countries, you know, my understanding is it takes two to four years of fairly substantial training, including things around dispute resolution, um, that is a much more expansive career path towards policing than what takes place in, in, in many of our communities in America. So I would like to look at how we better match um, law enforcement training and people with the problems that you're confronting with. Uh, but I, but I know as well that, you know, many, many, many of our, of our um, police calls go into kind of domestic violence issues where one spouse may have a, a weapon, again, something that doesn't place, take place in a lot of other countries when we've got 310 million weapons uh, awash in America. And if you've got a spouse with a weapon, weapon threatening another spouse, I don't know whether a mental health, you know, maybe it's mental health with a law enforcement officer, um, but I do think this debate, which is long overdue, and why I think the Justice and Policing Act that Senator Kamala Harris and Cory Booker put forward, I'm proud to be one of the original co-sponsors of that. I think that's the kind of legislation we need. It takes on this question of how we allocate resources correctly. Clearly, we don't need to bring down some of these military funding tools um, that are agents of war in, onto our city streets. Um, but I'm, I'm really concerned as we get into this debate later this week, or if we get into this debate, whether Senator McConnell, the Republican majority leader, is actually going to let us have a fulsome debate or whether the bill that the Republicans have put forward, Senator Scott's bill, they're just going to try to jam it through. This is an issue, obviously, all these issues around defund the police, appropriate role for the police, training for the police, where we ought to allocate our resources. This is the issue of our time right now uh, for, for so, so many Americans, and it deserves a full and bipartisan and you know, fulsome debate, not some kind of political antics that too often passes for debate on the, um, on the floor of the Senate. Um, and that's where I'm hoping, again, that Leader McConnell, I'm going to see some of my Republican colleagues later tonight, I can make the case, hey, let's really, you know, we may not always agree, but let's go ahead and have a fulsome debate on this extraordinarily important topic that millions and millions and millions of Americans are on the street protesting. I was at uh, a Juneteenth event in Vienna, Virginia at, at the um, uh, First Baptist Church of Vienna, the oldest church, also the oldest African-American church in Vienna. But um, there was a crowd, uh, close to 500 people outdoor in the parking lot, socially distanced for the most part, everybody with masks. and you know, extraordinarily diverse, where people are saying, hey, these questions around how we can make sure that all Americans, no matter uh, what their race feels like the police are there to defend them and protect them, um, we have to grapple with this as a country. And the first place we ought to start on that is a debate on the Senate floor, I hope, this week. Um, <clears throat> I'm getting a nice, was a nice comment here about trying to reach out to as many Virginians as I had to during the COVID-19 crisis. I think that's part of my job when I'm asking you guys to hire me again. You know, I need to be there to try to, one, help get resources to, to folks in moments of crisis, two, to listen to areas where the Congress is not doing a good job, or three, um, listening to you who disagree with me as well. You know, my job uh, we got eight and a half million Virginians is to listen to everyone, whether I, they agree with me or not agree with me, try to listen respectfully, try to respond respectfully. Um, and, you know, I hope that uh, you will treat uh, me the same way, even if you don't uh, agree with me. And I, I do hope I'm seeing some of the commentary back and forth on the side uh, that even with folks you can disagree with here, that you'll do it in a way that's um, somewhat, somewhat respectful. Uh, Dottie Smith, this pointed out that it's gotten a lot easier to mail in votes, a re request for mail in votes online in Virginia. And Dottie, I think that's a great point. And you can go to your local um, uh, community you live in and go to the, the government page and you can make a request uh, now for, uh, for um, um, getting your absentee voting. You know, we need to do that early if you care to do it this that way this year. And again, most of these ballots will be set literally over the next couple of weeks. There's a couple, I think there's some um, most of the primaries are tomorrow. There was a fifth district congressional Republican primary 
uh, about 10 days ago. I think the Republicans are still trying to make some decision. It may be, it's been delayed into July on, on their candidate for the seventh congressional district against our great new Congresswoman, Abigail Spanberger. But you know, very soon, um, you know, getting ready to start voting as early as possible. Uh, you know, we're gonna have to have a totally different campaign this year. Uh, particularly if we're still trying, if we're still social distancing, or God forbid, if we see a a um, a upsurge, uptick again on um, uh, on the COVID illness. One of the things, since this is, uh, I'm doing this not in my official capacity, but as as a candidate for for Senate, if you um, want to get involved in our campaign, you can very easily by going to markwarnervacaps.com, um, or if you want to. If you've got specific casework that you're looking for help and assistance uh, on my official side, please go to warner.senate.gov and folks from the official staff um, uh, uh, will we'll try to get back to you. Uh, Tashoni is asking me a question on removal of some of the monuments and um, the Confederate monuments. And, and this is an issue that has you know, been around uh, for years in Virginia. And I think the, the majority of, of uh, Virginians' positions have, have in many ways evolved. And I think um, these monuments who, you know, for many, don't reflect history, but reflect oppression uh, that our fellow Virginians you know, shouldn't have to pass by those uh, on, a, on a daily basis. I think it's time for these monuments um, to be taken down. And I think, again, um, there ought to be a, an, an appropriate debate about where they ought to be located. Um, but that, you know, at this moment in time, when we see so much angst um, and anger and frustration and exhaustion on our streets, um, I do think whether it's the governor or others, um, they're, making, they're making the right choice. Um, I know in Alexandria, uh, there was a a um, statue of a Confederate soldier uh, kind of looking away from Washington uh, that, that got taken down in early June and, and um, for the most part has not, um, that I'm aware of at least, I live in Alexandria, generated that much um, controversy. Um, uh, Audrey uh, has said we need voting in person, early voting and voting by mail, all three. Audrey, I hope I'm saying your name right. I agree with you. Uh, and you know, from a plain old campaigning standpoint, generally speaking, in the past in Virginia, because we didn't have a lot of early voting, we had fairly restrictive absentee voting. The vast, vast majority of our votes came on on election day. I think this year it's going to change dramatically. I think we're already seeing that in the Democratic congressional primary is going to take place tomorrow. So we need all three. And in our campaign, we want to set a new. Um, template and learn from other states where we can urge our voters, get out, vote early, and then we can focus on our resources on those who've, um, who've, not, um, uh, uh, who, who've not yet voted, so we can focus on them. And again, a lot of very good information going on on the, on the, on the chat lines here on how you can uh, uh, get access to ballots, get access to uh, voter information. Um, Yeah, Morgan is asking a very good question. And Morgan, I think, is is white, and he lives in rural Virginia. How do you, um, how can folks in white in rural Virginia uh, help the Black Lives Matter movement, especially when you know a lot of the, the debate is is around uh, maybe memorials or statues or other things? And I, you know, I really think I was on uh, a Zoom earlier today. Um, and I think about a lot of South Side communities, which are, you know, in many cases, from 25 to 55 to 60 percent um, African American Black communities. I really think a lot of this is going to take place in terms of people-to-people -people conversation, whether it's kind of you know as we move past COVID, hopefully back into um, you know picnics and barbecues with appropriate social distancing. You know, I, I somehow think some of these conversations are easier done. At a, at a barbecue or a picnic than in a board of supervisors um, county meeting. 
and and I hope as as time um, um, as as time has has moved on, or uh, that that's that's might be the best setting. But we've got to make sure we can get back to those social distancing um, uh, appropriate mass protected my mass here um, uh, settings. You know, Kaiser has raised another question um, about the Farmville facility and, and and the ICE detainees, and um, you know, I owe you a, uh, I owe you at least more facts than I have right now, uh, and then you know, even if I make a determination, you know, um, this is obviously the administration that's not been very favorable to. Uh, um, immigrants on virtually any level, although uh, thank goodness we saw a, I think a very positive uh, result from the Supreme Court last week. Um, and um, you know, sometimes, you know, whether it's the Supreme Court on DACA kids or whether it was the Supreme Court the earlier week on GLBTQ uh, rights, um, you know, uh, gives you a little more faith on rule of law. But I owe uh, Kaiser and and um, um, the others, uh, you know, more more data at least and fuller answers on the the Farmville facility uh, with ICE. Um, and uh, and asks the question or making a comment saying that she's hysterical about um, Trump firing the or not firing, frankly forcing out. Didn't really fire, I don't think the career journalist who been at Voice of America. Voice of America for many of our younger followers may not be a, a you know, that much caught, caught in their head and lexicon, but for many of us growing up, you know, when it was kind of the West versus communism, Voice of America was our leading um, media uh, source to try to give folks, whether it was, um, you know, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, in, in certain repressive regimes around the world, a chance to hear kind of unfettered news, um, not dissimilar to the BBC. Uh, and I think the Voice of America, well, obviously had an American viewpoint, uh, was extraordinarily well regarded. And unfortunately, again, um, the Trump administration has put a close political um, favorite of Mr. Trump in and the long-term career journalists uh, recently um, retired. And and I don't think um, um, on that case, uh, again, the best thing we can do about getting Voice of America back to being the voice of America and, and a voice that people around the world can trust is uh, let's let's make sure we hire Joe Biden um, come the fall. Um, let's see. Again, a lot of folks and, you know, and, 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 and let me say whether it's. Dina or Kaiser or I think we let me just see who else was at or uh, Alina, um, um, you know, keeping on me on the ice um, facility in in, in Farmville. Um, I see your passion. I know your your interest in this, and um, you've you've helped educate me. I'm going to go back again and and do some more. Uh, looking at what's happening uh, there and what actions we might be able to take. But I, I don't think I realized that it was up to 34 of the detainees um, being uh, COVID positive. Um, all right. Margie is asking, what's the Senate's plan in supporting schools with new COVID guidelines? Well, Margie, this is a this is a really, really good question. And I would argue that, let me take it in two baskets. One is K-12 education. And most of that is guidance is going to come from the governor or from your local school division or your local school board. And the biggest thing the Senate can do to help that is to help those schools is to put some more money in the next COVID bill for state and local government. Um, the fact that we put a little over 100 billion in the first bill and we put 600 billion into small businesses, you know, is, is a little bit of a strange ratio since State and local government also imply, you know, employs lots and lots of folks, provides essential services, 
And for many, many of these state and local governments have seen the revenues completely dry up. So we need additional money for state and local governments. On higher education, Margie, you know, this is an area that I think, I don't think the Congress has been supportive enough, but I also think there's gonna be a bit of a day of reckoning, particularly for some of our independent liberal arts colleges, some of them, particularly some of the private ones who've been kind of on the edge. If they don't have a large endowment, and I do think that a lot of these schools that have large endowments ought to be willing to spend down a little more. If you've got a large endowment, you know, what better time than now? This is an unprecedented crisis. Uh, but for for um, many of our smaller liberal arts private colleges, and I'm a big supporter of those. I was the I was the president of the Virginia Foundation for Independent Colleges, kind of the United Way for our, our, our private colleges, private four-year colleges in Virginia, um, uh, like, you know, Washington Lee, University of Richmond, Sweetbriar was one, Hollins was one, Virginia Wesleyan, Marymount. Um, but I think a lot of them are gonna have a real challenge, particularly as we come back in when these schools are gonna have modified numbers that can stay in their dorms. How do you, how do you get the classes all right? You know, how do we do testing? This is an area where I'm very sympathetic um, to trying to make sure all our colleges get appropriate testing um, um, resources. And then th those testing resources that we give some protection for the schools to make sure that if, as long as they meet appropriate safety standards, uh, you know, they're not going to be over the top liable because that, would, that could actually um, put a lot of these schools uh, out of business. So Margie, those are some of my ideas um, um, on, um, uh, on what we do for schools. And my dear, dear friend, Daphne Reed. Oh my gosh, it's Daphne. I hope you and Tim are great. And they are dear friends that I partnered with on a, on a actually movie studio in Petersburg, Virginia. Um, it keeps being interrupted. Well, I don't, that's probably Daphne because we we're probably, you're probably still in parts of Virginia that don't have enough high-speed broadband internet. And this is an area that, frankly, again, um, there's a lot of things I think Congress has done well in the COVID world, helping high, uh, helping put more resources into high-speed broadband internet. We have not done as well. And let me just give you the quickie top line. As you know, my background was in this field, so I'm a little obsessed about it and was very proud when I was governor that we did the largest rural broadband deployment in the whole country through the mid-Atlantic broadband, a lot in South Side and Southwest using tobacco commission funds. But I think we could do the short-term emergency plan of simply turning up power on a lot of our existing towers, putting additional towers on schools that may be wired to give coverage for the surrounding community under an emergency basis. I think in some communities where the incumbent provider has not provided service at all uh, for a long period of time, we ought to go ahead and allow the community to to fund a competitor, whether that's the local utility company or someone else. And I also think we need to kind of be willing to chew on the big enchilada, which is, you know, Jim Clyburn has taken the lead, great congressman from South Carolina in the House on, you know, an 80 to $100 billion package uh, that would actually make sure that we make the same kind of commitment on high-speed broadband to Americans that Franklin Roosevelt made on electrification back during the 30s. Because I think if there's one thing, Daphne, we've learned during these emergencies, um, high-speed broadband, whether it's for telehealth or work or studies, it's not a nice to have, it's an essential. And uh, again, our country is unfortunately behind many, many both Asian and European countries on that broadband deployment. Um, <clears throat> okay, Kathy is asking a question about, what about the disclosure lack of disclosure over the you know, hundreds of billions of dollars giving out on, on COVID. Well, Kathy, I think this is gonna get better. On one level, um, you know, any of the small businesses that have received a $150,000 loan or more, that will be laid out in, in the coming weeks. And in terms of the, what's called the, there's something called the 133 facilities that the Federal Reserve puts together. This is where the, the, the Treasury puts up some money, the Federal Reserve uh, puts up some money, and, and it's not given out, but it's lent out, or we go out and buy, for example, commercial paper or, or other areas to kind of shore up businesses. And this is similar to what the Federal Reserve did after the 2008 crisis. I strongly believe 
those purchasing actions um, ought to be revealed. And um, Kathy, I'll try to get you a better answer on that because I think they are going to be. I think you know everything has been so focused on on getting some of these facilities set up. For example, one that was supposed to be dealing with the the mid level markets, what's called the um, um, the Main Street facility, just got set up and operational um, either end of last week or this week. So let's let's um, let me make sure I try to get back to you on that. Um, Okay, Maggie is saying, um, is actually saying that a lot of the folks are being very um, civil with each other and, and maybe it has to do with the storm. I'm not sure if the storm is, is helping the reception or hurting the reception, but maybe it's just making us all a little more civil to each other. And that's, that's a, that would be a good thing. Anything uh, that we can, um, uh, that we can, we can get at. Um, Barb, um, Barb is asking, what can we do to prevent, um, you know, cl crime in, in black neighborhoods? I think that's, we're going to have to get more community involvement. I, I think this is again, you know, if in black and Af African American, uh, communities, people feel the police is not there to protect them. That's not going to do a lot to kind of encourage um, a good um, relationship with the community, and not going to do a lot to prevent the kind of uh, uh, you know alliance that you need to have an effective crime prevention, particularly you know, when you're also grappling with issues uh, around, as Barb points out, around gangs. Which is you know, uh, um, I honestly believe that you know there's. There's some component of law enforcement, clearly with gangs, if they're violent, but an awful lot of, of you know, uh, work on gangs, at least what I've read and, and learned, you know, you need social workers, you need that mental health professionals, you need support systems that can give um, young people, particularly young men, an alternative to the gang. And if that becomes the de facto uh, only place to turn for, um, for status, uh, then we end up with some of these problems. But this goes again to the question of how we rethink resources that are currently simply directed at policing um, and, and not necessarily about violence pr prevention, uh, how we do need the kind of review that, that many of you are calling um, uh, for. All right, Will is, um, well, Will, that's a great, great question. Um, he, Will is asking a question about saying holidays are appreciated, but what other substantial things that can be done? Uh, a fair equity that's needed to be applied in resources. Um, and Will, let me tell you the, as you may know, my background has all been in, in kind of on the economic and the business side. And I am gravely concerned that after Labor Day, when some of these COVID support programs um, start to wind down, that we could see enormous, enormous losses in minority businesses and in all businesses that service low-income communities. And so I am, the thing I'm working on the most, the thing I'm most committed to trying to get in the next COVID package is a substantial infusion of assistance to Black-owned banks, to what are called community development financial institutions, CDFIs, what does that mean? These are institutions that lend into um, low-income communities, minority communities, so it's Black businesses, Latino businesses, because they've not had the same access to capital um, that majority-owned businesses have had. They didn't get it, they didn't participate as well in the PPP program. Matter of fact, uh, there, there's a roughly around three million Black businesses in this country, a little less. About two million of those are sole proprietors. So many of those, you know, the, the, the individual consultant, the individual person who's got a single chair um, barbershop, um, you know, they um, didn't get the access to the PPP funds. So some of the lending institutions that have serviced those communities, um, CDFIs, black owned banks, really need both the kind of equity infusion and the kind of what's called clearing out their balance sheets, the same way we help some of the big banks after 2008 and 2009. And, and, and I really, 
I have, I don't want to uh, make a promise I can't keep, but I, I really, really think I'm, 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 I'm building a coalition here, uh, and I think I got some of my Republican colleagues to go along. We really need to shore up the access to capital, the access to finances in minority communities um, and try to get this capital out and ready to get, be deployed. Uh, I hope by Labor Day or we're going to have um, we're going to have a, a even worse crisis than we are than we can that we're dealing with right now. Um, lots of great questions here. Um, Um, you know, um, he, Crystal is asking a question about student resource officers, and you know, and and, and that means law enforcement officers. And and I, I I've been asked this question a number of times. And I, Crystal, I I like to, um, I know a number of jurisdictions are starting to say. You know, we want to take these law enforcement officers out of the police or out of the schools. And um, I want to learn more here. I mean, I, I do think um, I'm not sure that in many schools uh, that the kind of relationship between the students and the law enforcement officers have been built up the right way. But Crystal, I'm, I'm anxious to learn more on this, this subject and appreciate the comments that, you, that you're making. Um, Meg here. Oh, Meg. Uh, Meg, a former head of Virginia Education Association and a, a real expert on teaching. Meg has said as now a retired teacher, uh, student re re resource officers need better training to remain in schools. And Meg, I think this goes to the the, the whole question, um, you know, whether SROs in schools, law enforcement officers on the streets. I don't, you know, there are clearly activities that have horrified us that we've seen on our television sets over the last number of months. But we've also got to acknowledge we put a lot of law enforcement officers in a lot of circumstances that they were probably never trained or equipped for. And you know, if the immediate reaction is to you know, go for your firearm because you feel threatened as well, that that's, has led to the kind of crisis as we see here. And so I hope you all and others will continue and educate me on you know, what are these best practice models that maybe other countries have used? I mean, I keep coming back to some of the stuff I've heard over the last couple of weeks that, you know, of the differential in time it takes to become a law enforcement officer in America versus a UK, which is a diverse society as well. Um, uh, and, and um, you know, just the remarkable differences in terms of uh, the number of folks who, who um, end up getting hurt or killed in, uh, in interactions with law enforcement in um, obviously America uh, over what's happening in, in places like the UK. Um, okay, we're going to see. Okay, Pat is asking. And his wife, I guess, Anne, what is the status of the HEROES legislation? This, I think, will be my last question. Uh, HEROES legislation was what came up in, in the House, uh, a very generous COVID package, close to $3 trillion. Um, the White House and Leader McConnell have indicated, you know, basically zero appetite uh, on that. I'm engaging with some folks in the administration now on what might be in the next COVID package. There's a lot of good things in HEROES that I want to bring over. Um, you know, I don't think we'll see this legislation up until the middle of July. I think that's unfortunate. I think that, you know, um, um, you know, I'm I'm hoping that July, you know, j the the July unemployment numbers will be as good as the May. I mean, sorry, the June unemployment numbers will be as good as the the May numbers. Um, but as we see these, you know, million and a half people each week, the last couple of weeks, still file for unemployment. Uh, I I am very frustrated that. Um, uh, Leader McConnell, and it, it appears this president doesn't feel any sense of urgency. Um, you know, there was a story in the New York Times, I think today, that showed that because the last couple of packages have been generous, we've not seen the dramatic increase in poverty that we would have anticipated. That's a great thing. I think, you know, history will look back 
on both the Democrats and the Republicans and say they did the right thing at a huge moment of crisis. But we are not out of the woods. I, I go back to my earlier question about how we need to get support for black owned banks, minority businesses, communities, low income communities, black and white um, and, and Latino that are going to be really hurting when some of these subsidy dollars uh, go down. So um, something that I'm going to make a top priority for me in the next legislation. And um, again, I'll be looking at some of the great things that were in the, in the heroes package to bring over as well. We're about out of time. I would again, urge any of you who, who are involved, if you are uh, willing to get involved in the campaign, to go to Mark Warner, capital V, capital A, dot com. If you've got casework, to go to warner.senate.gov. Um, tomorrow, I find out who my Republican opponent's gonna be. But as I said at the outset, I'm taking nothing for granted in this campaign. I hope many of you who uh, participated in this Facebook Live will join me in this effort. Um, I wanna make sure we keep Virginia blue. I wanna make sure that um, we send a strong uh, message about what we think about Mr. Trump's um, governing of this nation. And that's gonna take us all involved. And so many of you have asked such great questions about voting protection and early voting. Uh, we need your energy ideas and input in the campaign. And back to some of these comments as well on the, the issue about the Farmville um, ICE facility, you know, I owe you some um, um, more information and, and um, um, some more ideas than I put up so far. And I very much appreciate your passion. Thank you all. Stay safe, everybody. And uh, um, let's go get them. <laughs>